This one will go to him. Ian Blackford. Thank you, uh, Mr Crosby. And also let me thank the honourable member for Gainsborough for bringing his amendment to the Scotland Bill this afternoon. And can I also pay credit to the honourable member for Gainsborough? Because I think not just in the speech that we've heard this afternoon, but in the other contributions we've heard over the debate of the Scotland Bill, that we've had many thoughtful and, I think, intelligent contributions as to the future of Scotland, and in his case, about the preservation of what he sees as a union. On our bench, he's become from a, a different proposition, but nonetheless, I respect the position that the Honourable Gentleman has taken and the clear thought that has gone into the contributions that he has made. Uh, Mr Crosby, those of us on these benches in our election campaign asked the people of Scotland to vote for us in order that we came to this House to speak up to what we were promised by Gordon Brown, that we would get as close to federalism as was possible, and much was said about delivering home rule in the spirit of Keir Hardie. It is on that basis that we can argue that with the majority of the popular vote and winning 56 of the 59 seats that my hon. Friend referred to, that we have a clear and express mandate from the Scottish people to get what was proclaimed Home Rule for Scotland. And it is in that context that I commend the amendment that we have in front of us today. It seems to understand the expectations of the Scottish people for the return of power to Holyrood, which has become much stronger over the course of the recent past. As I mentioned, the Honourable Member for Gainsborough comes from a different perspective to us in as far as he wants to protect the Union. We wish to see powers in the hands of the Scottish Parliament that allow us to deliver sustainable economic growth, but sustainable economic growth that allows us to deliver on the social priorities that the people of Scotland expect. I would say to the Secretary of State for Scotland and to the Government that if they will not listen to the Scottish people and their elected representatives who occupy these benches, then perhaps the Government should listen to the wise counsel that in this case comes from their own benches. We respect that the Government won the election in the UK. When I say respect, of course, it doesn't mean that we like it. But, however, the Government should also respect that we won the election in Scotland. Yeah. The Honourable Member, of course, is a lone government voice with only 14 per cent of Scots voting for his party, the lowest level of support for a Tory government in history. It is clear that the Scottish people want the Parliament in Edinburgh to have greater control over welfare. It is in this context that I am minded by the quotation often mentioned by my right honourable friend for Gordon and taken from the words of Charles Stuart Parnell. No man has the right to fix the boundary to the march of a nation. No man has the right to say to his country, thus far shall thou go and no further. Perhaps whether it is to be on this amendment or indeed in many others that the government ought to reflect on that quotation. The issue of fiscal autonomy and freedom to deliver on our aspirations for social security are intertwined. For us, fiscal autonomy is about hope and aspiration, something we heard of just recently. We need the full sets of powers to deliver a new Scottish Enlightenment that recognises that we need to create the circumstances that will drive up an investment, deliver growth and productivity, <coughs> and that will result in the rise in real wages, generating the tax receipts that will allow us to deliver investment in social policy, particularly in social security. That is why we are critical of the taxation powers on offer that leave the Scottish Parliament in direct control over less than 30 per cent of taxation, and crucially falls way short on the range of tax powers that could see us incentivise the Scottish economy and deliver growth. Mr Crosby, it is critical as the issue of sustainable growth that is central to our desire to deliver the investment that we need in welfare. Our desire is to invest, deliver a stronger economy and, through doing so, create the resources that allow us to invest in social protection and, as part of this, to be able to look after today's and tomorrow's pensioners. It is with these remarks that I welcome the amendment put down by the Honourable Member for Gainsborough and the discussion we are now having. Mr Crosby, in just over a week from now, the Chancellor will deliver his emergency budget. I expect that there is in some quarters a sense of anticipation as to what the budget will be deliver. But there are many of us on this side of the House that look on forward to this with a sense of dread, knowing what is coming. It is the failure of the last government 
to grow the economy and deliver tax receipts that see the poor and the disadvantaged in the UK having to pay the price of that failure, with an expectation of an additional £12 billion of welfare cuts to come. It is the ongoing austerity regime that will drive increasing number of people into poverty that was central to our campaign to show that there was indeed an alternative to austerity and why we need powers in Scotland to protect our citizens from the most damaging aspects of the UK Government's welfare programme. Through the limited powers that have been referred to, we have today in the Scottish Government been presiding £300 million additional funds between 2013-14 and 2015-16 to mitigate families in Scotland from the impact of Westminster welfare cuts. Not only do we know that the pressure on many working families is going to increase, but we know that the UK Government wishes to reassess the definition of relative poverty, a sure sign that they recognise their policies are going to see a dramatic increase and the number of families pushed into poverty as a direct result of their measures. We know, Mr Crosby, from the analysis done by the IFS and much commented on by the Child Poverty Action Group, that up to 100,000 more children in Scotland risk being pushed into poverty by 2020. Mr Crosby, to us on these benches and many in Scotland, and indeed I expect throughout the UK, it is unacceptable that anybody should be living in poverty in Scotland and in the UK. It is for amongst those and other reasons that we need powers over welfare in Scotland. There is, I may say, a principle which is important to many of us on our side, and we firmly believe that society is as strong as its weakest link. It is a principle that I would argue is in the mainstream of public opinion in Scotland. The welfare cuts to come would lead us to the conclusion that it is not something which is shared by all. Let me turn to the question of pensions that was raised by the Honourable Member of Gainsborough. One of our particular concerns is the increase in age when pensioners will access their state pension, going up to 66 in 2020, 67 between 2034 and 36, before increasing to 68 thereafter. Now, it may be perfectly acceptable in part of the UK where life expectancy has been rising. However, the disparity that exists between life expectancy north and south of the border suggests we need a Scottish solution to our own circumstances. As an example, life expectancy for a male child born today in Glasgow is 71.6 years, a full seven years below the average of the UK at 78.2. The World Health Organisation have claimed that in the district of Calton in Glasgow, life expectancy for males is 54 years, substantially below the current UK pension age, never mind before the increases that we expect to see. For women, the gap in life expectancy is also marked, 78 years against an average in the UK of 82.3. It is, Mr Crosby, a little wonder that the state pension in Scotland represents 11.9% of taxation and income, but 12.1% in the UK. Quite simply, we are not living long enough to enjoy the fruits of the old age pension. I welcome, therefore, that if powers over pension is to be devolved, it will allow our Parliament in Edinburgh to determine on how we reflect on our own circumstances to make sure that our citizens can look forward to a comfortable and secure retirement. The amendment from the Honourable Member would have the effect of devolving powers over all pensions, not just the state pension. We welcome this. It would allow us in Scotland to reflect on how we respond to the challenges that exist today, for example, for both defined contribution and defined benefit schemes. Of course, defined benefit schemes are something of a rare breed these days, and we should reflect on the damage that was done to the sustainability of such schemes as a consequence of the tax rate and pension schemes initiated by the previous member for Concordia and Cowden Beath when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer. There is a crisis, no not this one, there is a crisis, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do anything so rash. <laughs> there is a crisis in the funding of such schemes and the tax treatments of dividends is something that requires a fresh examination. We have the issue of pension freedoms initiated in the last Parliament. Now, whilst we broadly welcome the enhancement to consumer choice, we on this side of the House have gone on record as questioning the level of appropriate advice that consumers are receiving and that the risks that they may become apparent through the potential for mis-selling. 
These concerns, in our opinion, have not only been adequately, have not on, but been adequately addressed. It is perhaps something that, through devolving to Scotland, that the Parliament in Scotland would want to look at. Mr Crosby, in conclusion, we welcome the amendment before us today, and we do so particularly in the light of the threats we see to the attack on the most vulnerable in our society if the government goes ahead with its threatened £12 billion of cuts. We also do so in recognising we can only deliver if we have fiscal responsibility as part of the equation. We recognise our responsibilities to look after the vulnerable in our society. Whilst I stress that we firmly believe that we need the powers over our economy to deliver sustainable economic growth and to grow the tax base, generating the resources not only to deliver a wealthier but a fairer Scotland, passing this amendment today at least gives us the power to intervene when we can do so to ameliorate some of the pain that will be afflicted on so many of our people by the policies of the current UK Government. Patricia Gibson. Mr Crosby, I am delighted to rise and speak in favour of Amendment 118 and New Clause 45, calling for the removal of the requirement for for the Scottish Government to obtain consent from a UK Secretary of State in relation to universal credit and the cost of claimants who rent accommodation. In the light of the mandate mandate that we in the SNP benches have from the Scottish people and the lack of the democratic mandate that the Conservatives, indeed any of the other parties have in Scotland, Mm. we urge all in this House to support this amendment. Mm. We set out unequivocally in our manifesto that as part of our welfare priorities, there should be an immediate scrapping of the bedroom tax and a halt to the rollout of universal credit and PIP payments and that we would support an increase in the work allowance, policy supported by both the people of Scotland and Civic Scotland. And we have a clear and democratic mandate for this demand in the light of the general election result. We are particularly concerned about the work allowance element of universal credit, the amount of income a household can earn before the universal credit entitlement is reduced. And we demand that the work allowance is devolved to the Scottish Government as part of new Clause 45. And democratic integrity requires that this demand is met. Whilst we support increases in the personal tax allowance, we also back an increase in the work allowance. In this, we are in keeping with a Resolution Foundation policy proposal paper, which pointed out, and I am quoting, If we really want to help working families on low and middle incomes, boosting the work allowance would be more effective and better value for money than any tax cuts. For a lone parent with housing costs, for example, the work allowance is currently set at just over £3,000 per year. After that point, benefits start to be withdrawn. For example, those on universal credit lose £65 of benefit for every £100 of post-allowance salary. Now, of course, we need some sort of tapering system put in place to make work pay, but the complexity of the system is what allows, indeed encourages, the government to focus on simpler measures, even if those simpler measures are far less effective. Take the personal allowance. People begin paying tax at 20% after earning £10,000 a year, but we pay less attention to the fact that a sole working parent faces a 65% deduction rate when they earn over £3,000 a year. And if you receive universal credit and pay income tax, the Chancellor's £600 per year increase to the personal allowance, of course welcome, this would boost your income by £42. But the same increase in work allowance would increase your income by £300. And even the Institute of Fiscal Studies has weighed into this debate, arguing that, arguing that in-work benefits provide a more precise and cost-effective way of supporting low-earning working families than changes to direct taxes. The freezing of working allowance is profoundly misguided and effectively cuts the benefits of workers on low incomes. What happened to making work pay? 
What we need is a work allowance to help ensure that those in work have a better chance of lifting themselves and their families out of poverty. We need the power in Scotland to change working allowances in Scotland so that we can help families to help themselves out of poverty as they go out every day to earn a living through increasingly difficult times. Universal credit does not help some of our poorest households, but much could be done by increasing work allowance and making work pay. And this could be one, only one, but this could be one of the tools which could help combat the scandal of those in work having to rely on food banks to put food on their tables and feed themselves and their families. Scotland needs powers over the work allowance element of universal credit. No ifs, no buts. Now, it's already been mentioned by my honourable friend for Banff and Buchan, but I wish again to draw the House's attention to a letter in today's Herald. It's a letter from the third sector in Scotland protesting against the socially divisive and damaging impact of the UK government's cuts of a further £12 billion in social security spending. Cuts which, despite attempts to rewrite history, the Labour Party signed up to prior to the general election. These cuts... These cuts... And I would put these cuts in the context of the pre-election debate when the Honourable Member for Leeds West said the Labour Party was not the party of people on benefits. These cuts, I notice there's nobody talked to that. These cuts, first, these cuts, first and foremost. No, thank you. I've already informally given way to the gentleman at the front bench. These cuts. These cuts, first and foremost will bear down on the most vulnerable and poorest in society. The whole of the third sector in Scotland supports the devolution of working age benefits to Scotland because there is a recognition that the Scottish Government can and will do things better. It will set out a welfare system competently and with compassion. Make no mistake, such devolution of welfare powers. I will give way to the gentleman. I am I, um, listening with great care to the honourable lady, and I hope that my uh, right honourable friend on the front bench and the opposition spokesman are also listening to her, because I would maintain that she is making actually from another direction the same point as I was making. The more that you just dribble out powers, they will constantly blame us. Everything they go wrong, that goes wrong, they will blame on us. Cuts, cuts, we're responsible. Give them the responsibility, and they'll have to take responsibility. We will be proud to take responsibility for investing in the growth of Scotland's economy, yeah, investing yeah, yeah. in our infrastructure, and investing in the people of Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Make no mistake, the devolution of these powers of welfare in the Scotland Bill is supported by the Citizens Advice Scotland, Bernardo Scotland, the Child Poverty Action Group, the Church of Scotland, Oxfam Scotland, the Poverty Alliance, the STUC. I could go on, Mr Crosby, but I will not. I think the point has been made. We on these benches seek to protect those we represent in Scotland from <coughs> the worst excesses of this government, and we speak with the clear democratic mandate of the people of Scotland and behind that, we have the increasingly raised voices of Scotland's third sector and civic society. We must not balance the books on the backs of the poor. It is time the government listened to a valued and equal partner in this union, Scotland, in the, respect, in the, in the spirit of the respect agenda. For the record, and for the avoidance of any doubt, we in the SNP set out unequivocally in our manifesto that as part of our welfare priorities, there should be an immediate scrapping of the bedroom tax, a halt to the rollout of universal credit and PIP payments. As far as working age benefits go, this Scotland Bill does not meet what was set out in the Smith Agreement. 
Now, the Secretary of State for Scotland has argued that there is no effective UK government veto over powers, limited as they are, in the Scotland Bill with regards to welfare arrangements. Yet there is a clear requirement of the Scottish Government to, quote, have consulted the Secretary of State about the practicability of implementing the regulations. The Secretary of State would then have to give agreement as to when any change made to the regulations is to start to have effect, such agreement not to be, quote, unreasonably withheld. Mm. Mr Speaker, Mr Crosby, I should say, is it likely that the current Secretary of State and the Scottish people would ever agree on a definition of mm. what is unreasonable? For example, by way of illustration, the people of Scotland believe it is unreasonable that a party which has a far weaker mandate in Scotland than any time during any of the years when they last had a majority government now pontificates over what power Scotland should have, whilst reneging on the all-party agreements arrived at in Smith. The Secretary of State clearly thinks that this situation is entirely reasonable and presides over the dis dispatch box like a colossal Governor General with no shame and takes, and takes on the elected and legitimate representatives of the huge majority of the Scottish people. For the sake of social justice in Scotland, for the sake of our most vulnerable, who are being crushed beneath the weight of the illogical and misguided attempts to punish those who require assistance from the state, for the sake of what was promised in Smith, for the sake of Scotland's position as a valued and equal partner in this union, for the sake of the wisdom of Scotland's civic society, for the sake of our, the SNP's, democratic mandate, I urge this House to support Amendment 118 and New Clause 45. Yeah. 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 Tommy Shepherd. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Cosby. Um, we are talking here about a lot of amendments, some that cover matters of quite technical detail, but I think the context of this debate is about big ideas. It's about big differences between this side of the House and that side of the House. And I think there can be no bigger difference than how we view our society as regards to welfare provision. On this side of the House, we see welfare as a means of social insurance where we can work together to protect each other through periods of illness, disability and in old age and also to protect people who are the casualties of economic circumstances as they move from one uh, period of employment into another. It is something that we should do with kindness and with generosity and with a spirit of cooperation. Yeah, yeah. On the other side of the House, I fear we have an attitude which is founded on prejudice and parsimony. Yeah. It is about a welfare state which grudgingly gives to people as a means of last resort. And it is because of that difference in opinion that this debate matters so much, because we want the transfer of these powers to the Scottish Government in order that we can begin the task of creating a welfare system in Scotland that reflects the priorities and the ambition of the people who live in Scotland. I have no difficulty whatsoever in, remaining, in, in accepting that we remain part of the United Kingdom and that a minimum standard should apply as regards universal credit. I have to say to the Government, they have not set the minimum standard bar too high, so it won't be too difficult uh, to cross it. But in order to get beyond that, I think we need to work together. And the new clauses 45 and 46 provide a mechanism where both governments, the Scottish and the UK Government, can work together to look at how universal credit can be implemented in Scotland and how additional measures that the Scottish Government may choose to bring in can be implemented in that context. It offers an opportunity within the United Kingdom, within the settlement that was agreed uh, in the referendum and post-Smith, for the governments to work together and to do something constructive that will meet the aspirations of the Scottish people. And the reason I think why this is important is because we want to move away from what's happening to welfare in this country. And the, I was just going to quote the Honourable Member for Wokingham, actually, but, but I'll take the intervention now. Description of what we want from our welfare system in his, in his opening remarks, but could he tell me by how much would he want the pension and the universal credit to go up to meet his aspirations compared with what is on offer? The Honourable Gentleman has, on several occasions in, in this and the <coughs> previous debate, uh, 
you know, talked about cost and how much uh, is going to be paid for, for certain welfare benefits. I have to say to him, you must not assume that the cuts that your government are making in the welfare budget are cost-free. There will be consequences for what you are doing. If you reduce the amount of money that poor people have so that you impoverish them even more, then there are consequences for the rest of society. It will increase the burden on our National Health Service as people become physically and mentally ill. It will drive people to drug dependency and petty crime, put extra demands on our police service. And most of all, it will cost our economy in the lost opportunity of those wasted lives. So do not think for one minute that there are no consequences to what you are doing with the welfare budget. I think there's no better example. I'm anxious not to get into a debate with the Honourable Gentleman, but I'll take one more intervention debate, and I'm delighted he's prepared to get into one. I have no wish to take money away from people who need it, and we're fortunately not having to debate that today. But what is the answer? How much more is needed to meet his aspirations, which are for greater generosity than the government has volunteered? I'm happy to have a debate. I just didn't want to have a debate with the honourable gentleman by himself. Um, I, that, is, that, that, will be a matter, that will be a matter for assessment. We will have to sit down and work out exactly how much more will be required. The question here is who should make the assessment. Should it be the representatives of the people in the Scottish Government or should it be someone else? I wanted to talk for one moment about the bedroom tax, which has been mentioned several times in this chamber. And just to give one uh, example, rather than uh, a human story, rather than uh, the statistics that people have thrown around. I have a 62-year-old constituent who uh, has lived in the area for 30 years in the same two-bedroomed house. She's brought up her family, and they have now left her. She now suffers from chronic angina and arthritis. She can barely leave the house, never mind go into employment. She is not probably going to work again. Now, the question is, what type of social protection do we offer someone in that position? She was in the situation when I came across her last year, of, being, of running up against the, uh, the spare bedroom subsidy regulations and being told that she would either lose £14 a week off her benefit or she would have to move house. Not having £14, she inquired about where she should move house. And the only options that were being given to her were five miles away in an estate with a number of social problems that her own did not have, with no family, friend support and no ability to continue the, the life that she had. She was at almost terrorised when I came across her, at the point of distraction, making herself ill. I'm glad to say that because of the actions of the Scottish Government, we have now been able to help that woman and others in her situation. But I fear for the people throughout the rest of the United Kingdom who are in that terrible situation. Another example of the parsimony is the sanctions regime, which has been mentioned several times in, in this chamber already. Let us not kid ourselves that the officials in the DWP are using sanctions as a last resort in these cases. In many cases, they are being used as a first resort. We all know of cases where people have been sanctioned for the most petty of breach of regulations. I have a, I, I have a constituent... Uh, yes. There was much, uh, I'm grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. There was much talk in the last parliament and during the election campaign where the Tory members opposite chuntered on about the Labour Party apparently wishing to weaponise the NHS. From the assessment he's just given, I'm sure you'll agree with me, that they've weaponised the social security system yeah, and terrorising yeah, yeah. people across the country with it. Yeah. The Honourable Gentleman makes a, a, an excellent point. Uh, so it is beca uh, because of the iniquity of the current system and the prospect that's being held out of worse things to come that we seek a change. We seek to be able to take control and to shape a welfare system in Scotland which will meet the aspirations of the people. And I, I would, uh, the Honourable Gentleman earlier in the debate uh, from uh, Nottingham, I think it was, uh, said that perhaps we can do that and we can be an example to what might happen in the rest of the United Kingdom. I hope very much that that would be the case. Yes. Member, for giving way. I can I congratulate him on the tone of his contribution because I think it's important that he does recognise the problems he is lucidly described are applicable to many working class people throughout the United Kingdom, including in my own constituency. We hope, of course, these powers will do something to help people in Scotland, but please remember there's people like that throughout the United Kingdom. I, I, I understand that point uh, uh, absolutely, and if we get a chance over the years ahead to join with you to try and vote for some of the measures we'll be putting through in Scotland to come into your constituents, I will be happy to take that opportunity to do so whilst welfare remains the responsibility of, of this Parliament. 
I want to now to turn to the, the question that's been raised of the veto uh, in, this, uh, in these clauses of the Secretary of State for Scotland. Now, I know that he will deny that it is a veto, but um, everyone else thinks it's a veto. <laughs> everyone else who's looked at this situation uh, thinks it's a veto, uh, including most of the third sector organisations in Scotland. And it would allow the Secretary of State the opportunity to object to a regulation that the Scottish Parliament might bring in to improve welfare, uh, the welfare system in Scotland. Now, how can that be right? How can it be right that you devolve a power, but yet you don't devolve it? You retain the authority to govern the, decision, uh, to govern the decisions. One of the, uh, one of the Conservatives uh, in an early stage in this Parliament in debating the Scotland Bill talked about trust and how we should all trust each other and life would be an awful lot better. Well, could the Secretary of State not see it in his heart to trust the Scottish <laughs> Government in order to make these regulations in the future? After all, we are talking about regulations that have to be taken within fairly closely defined parameters. So why on earth burden everyone with the, uh, with, the, with the requirement that the Scottish Government has to seek the Secretary of State's consent. It's absolutely ridiculous and I would say to the Secretary of State that if there was one thing, one indication he could give that he is listening to Scotland in this debate, it would be to accept that, to say fair enough, the Scottish Government takes a decision, we will let them go on with it because we have transferred the authority. We don't have to keep looking over their shoulder, we don't have to keep checking their homework. And I hope very much that he would take that on board because the, 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 the cr crux of this whole argument really, I think, is about, is about political authority. We are now in day four of the debate uh, on this bill, halfway through day four, and we have yet to see the Government and the Secretary of State suggest that they would make any substantive change yeah, yeah, to the yeah, proposed yeah, yeah. legislation whatsoever. The Minister of State earlier on suggested that the clauses as currently written were in line with the spirit and the substance of the Smith Agreement. Well, it's strange that everyone else disagrees with that, including the Scottish Parliament's devolution committee, on which the Conservative Party is represented, where an all-party group said that, in fact, the clauses as drafted do not represent the spirit or the substance of the Smith Agreement. Now, something has got to give here, unless we are going to rename the Secretary of State the Governor-General and just accept that we're not going to have government in Scotland with the consent of the people. But I hope very much that he will, uh, that he will listen to the people and that he will try and do something to accept some of these amendments. So I, I want to just to finish by, when I quizzed him on this yesterday, the Secretary of State uh, leapt to his feet and said that he was listening. In fact, he was in conversation with the Scottish Government and he uh, quoted conversations with my colleague, the Deputy First Minister, John Swinney. Uh, this has caused John Swinney to write to the Right Honourable David Mundell, Secretary of State at the Scotland Office today, uh, to say that, in fact, he considers his name's almost been taken in vain. And um, he says, and I, I quote, he says to the Secretary of State that you cited our productive discussion and then he says there will have to be clear movement by the UK government otherwise it is becoming harder to justify that description. Oh. The opportunity oh. is here today for the Secretary of State to make some minor concessions to show that he is willing to listen to the people who were elected in Scotland and I'm not talking now just about the 56 MPs, I think we can safely say that 58 out of the 59 MPs in Scotland do not want to see the Secretary of State have a veto over powers which this Parliament might devolve to the Scottish Government. And I hope very much that he will reflect on that and in his concluding remarks he will at least give some ground and show that he is listening. Yeah, yeah. Ian Murray. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Crosby. And can I pay tribute to the <coughs> member for Edinburgh East who's just spoken? And he was absolutely right at the start of his remarks to point out why we need a welfare system to give compassion to those who have fallen on hard times, whether that be through illness, disability or economic circumstances or even uh, old age. And He did tell the story of his 62-year-old constituent who was affected by the bedroom tax. I am sure everyone in their, uh, their surgeries can recall similar stories of the most vulnerable being hit the hardest by probably the most pernicious tax that any government uh, has ever bestowed uh, on the people. It is right that the Scottish Government has been able to mitigate the uh, bedroom tax in Scotland, but whilst we are on the second section of this particular debate, our new clause 31 
uh, that was rejected and the, uh, that will be voted on um, later on this evening um, gives the opportunity for the Scottish Parliament to have the powers to look at those kinds uh, of issues. So I, I think the uh, Honourable Member Fred Marie is actually right to, to have that description of the social security system, and that's the fourth time uh, we've agreed today. So uh, um, I hope that will continue uh, in that spirit. Um, I'd like to move, Mr Crosby, if I may, uh, amendments 5, 6 and 7, and new clause 28 and 53 in my name and those of my honourable friends. But let me say at the start that 5, 6 and 7, are, seven although different to the uh, SNP amendments 118 and 119 that have been moved, um, we will uh, support uh, the SNP amendments if they so move uh, those and, and withdraw uh, our 5, 6 and 7, uh, if they so choose to do that later on in this debate. But let me speak briefly, first of all, to clause stand parts uh, of this bill. Clause 24 gives Scottish ministers regulation-making powers in relation to the housing cost element of universal credit for claimants who rent their homes. The Secretary of State would retain regulation-making powers, meaning that both the Scottish and UK governments would have powers in this area and would be able to exercise them independently. Clause 25 gives Scottish ministers regulation-making powers for Scotland to provide for alternative payment arrangements in relation to universal credit, including uh, the, and I quote, the person to whom or the time when universal credit is to be paid. This will allow universal credit payments to be split between household members and for payments to be made more frequently than the current uh, monthly plan from the UK Government. Whilst I am sure we all welcome the devolution of these powers, this part of the Bill has caused considerable controversy by affording UK Ministers what some have interpreted as, as an effective veto over the regulation-making powers of the Scottish Government. This relates to the requirement in clauses 24 and 25 that Scottish ministers, before exercising their regulation-making powers in this bill, consult the Secretary of State on the practicability of implementing proposed changes to universal credit and obtain his agreement on when these changes are to happen. So it's worth perhaps examining whether or not that is uh, an amounting to an effective uh, veto. The Deputy First Minister, uh, John Swinney, who's just been uh, quoted by the Honourable Member for Edinburgh East, has detected in these uh, pretty innocuous requirements that they were his words a sinister intent on behalf of the UK Government to exercise, again in his words, a blocking power which would act to prevent the Scottish Government from doing something. What then exactly has the UK Government looking to do with regards to these uh, particular provisions in this Bill? That said, why, do I, why I do not believe that the Bill as it stands is intended as a veto, I do think it could be more clearly worded to remove any ambiguity whatsoever. And I hope the Minister, and I did say this to the Treasury Minister in the second reading of this debate, that they do have the opportunity to clear up any ambiguity. And if the Government are intent on saying there is no effective veto in these clauses in the Bill, then they should use this as an opportunity to once and for all take away that ambiguity and remove that particular uh, issue uh, in the bill, and that is what our amendments 5, 6, and 7 seek to do. They seek to allay the concerns of the Deputy First Minister uh, and the charitable organisations that have already been mentioned by clarifying that Scottish ministers need only consult the Secretary of State about the timing and, crucially, and this is uh, one of our amendments, the delivery mechanisms uh, of any new regulations. Now, I understand, Mr. Crosby, and fully appreciate that if uh, a discretionary housing payment is being made by the Scottish Government um, to recipients of the bedroom tax, if we could use that particular example, that they have that delivery mechanism. That delivery mechanism would go to local authorities. A pot of money could be given to local authorities to be able to then distribute that particular discretionary payment. So if there is an addition to universal credit and if the Scottish Government have the power to alter universal credit, then the uh, implications for the delivery mechanism are crucially important because they may have to use the Department of Work and Pensions or another reserve delivery mechanism um, that is part of the uh, UK Government. So if these clauses and if the uh, veto, as has been uh, explained, is a veto in the sense that the Secretary of State needs to approve the delivery mechanism, then I think he really has to look at redrafting those particular clauses to make that absolutely clear, because I think we would all understand that if there was a discretionary payment to be made in a reserve benefit or a top-up benefit that is currently paid uh, through the complicated system of the Department of Work and Pensions, then there would have to be some kind of discussion to be able to see if the, how, that would, uh, how that would operate. So I really appreciate if the uh, Secretary of State or the new Governor of Scotland, as I think he has been termed this afternoon, would be able to respond to the, that particular 
uh, comments around uh, the veto. Uh, let me mo turn now to uh, an incredibly serious matter and move Labour's new Clause 28, which proposes the full devolution of housing benefit to the Scottish Parliament. This is another new clause which has attracted significant support from across the third sector, including from the Scottish Council for Voluntary uh, Organisations. There are a number of significant compelling reasons why we believe uh, housing benefit should be devolved, none more so uh, than the joint report today issued by, to the UN by the four UK Children's Commissioners, um, warning that child, child poverty levels in the UK were unacceptably high and rising, uh, and their concern was, uh, main concern is with regards to the housing element uh, of that. As we said in our submission to the Smith Commission, I have to give way. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend. Isn't another compelling reason uh, for the effective devolution of housing benefit uh, to the Scottish Parliament this, that housing policy is already devolved to the Scottish Parliament and it would allow the Scottish Government to have a fully integrated policy using those resources much more smartly and effectively being able to abolish the bedroom tax? Bedroom tax. It's a, a touch of déjà vu because that's twice the honourable gentleman has intervened on the next sentence of my speech, uh, and it certainly hasn't been. It certainly hasn't been. I should stop sharing it around, shouldn't I, for comments in, in that sense? But he's absolutely uh, right, and that's exactly what we said in our, our submission to the Smith Commission. Perhaps he's read our submission to the uh, Smith Commission. If he has uh, any trouble sleeping in the evening, I'd, I'd highly recommend it to him. Uh, we want to increase the powers of the Scottish Parliament in areas that are closely related to devolved services, especially where this allows us to address and eliminate anomalies in the administration and delivery of vital public services. Housing policy is one such uh, anomaly. Most aspects of housing policy, specifically those relating to social housing and the building of social housing, are already devolved to Scotland, including most recently discretionary housing payments. It is my view that social housing and housing benefit are inextricably linked. It, is therefore, it therefore does not make sense for a devolved legislator to have control over one and not control over the other. That is a view shared by the Institute for Public Policy Research as well. Devolving housing benefit to Scotland would allow for a more holistic approach to housing policy in Scotland, affording the Scottish Parliament and, of course, crucially, local authorities far greater autonomy to tailor delivery to suit local and regional needs and circumstances. It would also transfer to the Scottish Parliament significant new resources with which to deal with the ongoing crisis in social housing in Scotland. At present, demand for social housing in Scotland, as across much of the UK, is greatly outstripping supply. Indeed, Scotland is facing its biggest housing crisis since the Second World War, with nearly 180,000 people in Scotland on social, waiting, social housing waiting lists, and indeed over 23,000 in my own city of Edinburgh alone. Earlier this year, Audit Scotland estimated that Scotland will need more than half a million new homes uh, in the next uh, 20, uh, tw 25 years. Uh, under the current government, we have the lowest number of house being, houses being built since 1947, and our public housing stock is also de decreasing drastically. The number of new social, housing, uh, new, so new social homes being built each year is down by over 20%. Uh, generation rent seems to be overlooked by government. Scotland's growing private rented sector faces rising rents and being forced to move house too often. On average, the uh, an individual living in a social rented housing only has the same address for an average of 2.6 years. Uh, and nearly half of those people who are moving around uh, in less than that average are indeed uh, families. Uh, over the last 10 years, the number of people living in the private rented sector has doubled to 368,000 and the number of households in poverty in the private rented sector has also doubled in the last decade to 120,000. In 2014, almost 1 million households or 2 million individuals were living in fuel poverty, an increase of almost 300,000 on the previous year, and that's all part of the policies in terms of people living in inadequate private housing. So we'll continue to fight for a better deal for the private uh, rented sector. Uh, Mr Crosby, meanwhile, uh, Shelter Scotland, the much respected charity in Scotland research, has previously identified the negative effect of homelessness and temporary housing on a child's education and health, and they have come up with some of the impacts, particularly on children and families with children, at living uh, inadequate housing in the uh, private rented sector, but also in terms of homelessness, the inability to get into social housing, uh, and indeed being stuck in temporary housing for too long. They have said uh, a number of things. If I could just pick out uh, one or two, they said that homeless children are two or three times more likely to be absent from school than other children due to the disruption caused by moving into and between temporary accommodation. I 
see that uh, drastically in my own constituency. I must have one of the most acute social housing uh, shortages in the country, and many families end up being stuck in temporary accommodation or moving within or around temporary accommodation uh, regularly. Uh, homeless children are three or four times more likely to have mental health problems than other children. That seems a fairly uh, obvious conclusion to come to uh, in terms of that instability. And 90% of respondents to a, shel a shelter survey said their children had suffered through living in temporary accommodation. So the longer families are living in temporary accommodation, the more likely they were to attribute to their worsening health uh, as a part of that uh, particular uh, accommodation. So it's uh, important that we're able to deal with some of those particular issues, but there is no doubt that housing benefits and the ability to access uh, housing benefit resources is inextricably linked to uh, building more social homes, but also uh, the whole of uh, social housing policy within the uh, Scottish uh, Parliament. Uh, Karen Campbell, the Director of Policy and Operations at Homes for Scotland, has previously said, and I quote, Scotland's housing crisis affects all tenures, whether for social, private, rent or sale. This is having a severe impact on the lives of Scots across the whole country, particularly young people and growing families. No other sector sector impacts such a wide range of policy issues, yet the number of new homes being built has fallen to its lowest level in some 70 years, threatening Scotland's social and economic well-being. And if we relate that to the uh, issues that have been um, raised by the shelter uh, survey, we can see that the social well-being of many families, particularly the children of those families, uh, is indeed uh, a real issue. So devolving housing benefit would afford the Scottish Parliament substantial additional funds to address the shortfall, unlocking up to £1.8 billion of resources the largest spend in a single benefit in Scotland after the old age state pensions, which could over time have new housing stock in Scotland. I appreciate that can't happen uh, overnight because there would have to be some mechanism uh, to allow that fund to be accessed, perhaps potentially through prudential borrowing that the local authorities could use to reduce housing benefit in order to build uh, more houses. Not only would this serve to alleviate the pressures on social housing, it would of course also create jobs and help to depress housing costs across the, re the private rented sector. As the Joseph Rowntree Foundation has noted, and I quote for their report, investing in affordable supply will place downward pressure on rents and subsequently reduce the burden of housing costs upon the budgets of low-income households living in the private rented uh, sector in Scotland. This is a hugely uh, important point because the Government have tried to come down incredibly hard uh, on the Housing Benefit Bill, and the Housing Benefit bill has doubled uh, over the last decade uh, or so, but what they haven 't been able to do is to deal with the uh, supply and demand issue and the number uh, of my constituents who end up in the much more expensive privately rented sector. Indeed, the privately rented sector in Edinburgh South is almost double uh, what a social or affordable housing rent would be, and that quite uh, clearly pushes up the housing benefit bill. And before the minister or the governor of Scotland jumps to his feet uh, and tells us that the uh, housing benefit bill is going up because of worklessness, actually nearly 70% of my constituents who um, obtain housing benefit are actually in work. So it's a huge issue, uh, not just in terms of the social impacts, but in terms of if we want to get the housing benefit bill down, we have to get people into much more uh, affordable uh, housing. Uh, as a, an added not insignificant bonus, devolving housing benefit, benefit would allow the Scottish Parliament to put an end, as we have discussed uh, already this evening, uh, to one of the cruelest and most iniquitous policies of recent years, uh, and that is the uh, bedroom tax. And also, um, this is also an issue where I think we should look at double devolution as well. And it has been a point that has been made regularly in these debates over the last three days uh, in terms of the Scottish Parliament being a, a very centralist parliament, and we need to get uh, powers down to the communities that are best uh, suitable to use. Them, and I would be very much of the view that housing benefits should be used uh, at local authority level because each local authority has their own needs and has their own demands in terms uh, of housing, whether that be for key workers or the demographics in which they, uh, in which they find themselves. I hope that this is, uh, these are strong arguments which convinces the Government and honourable members to support our new clause uh, 28. Uh, another area in which we believe this bill can be enhanced is in the provision of childcare. La Labour's new clause 53 would achieve this uh, enhancement by devolving the childcare element of universal credit to the Scottish Parliament. The childcare element is closely linked to the provision of employment support programmes, and devolving it would increase the capacity of the Scottish Parliament and local authorities to help parents to obtain and remain in employment by assisting them with the rapidly escalating costs of childcare. Costs of childcare, incidentally, that in Scotland have gone up much higher uh, than the rest of the United Kingdom. Kingdom. Currently, the cost of childcare is one of the main obstacles to parents entering and remaining in the labour market. 
Devolving the childcare element would afford the Scottish Parliament a valuable new mechanism for removing this obstacle and allowing parents to enter uh, the job market. As Dr McCormick, the Scotland advisor to the Joseph Roundtree Foundation and a member of the Social Security Advisory Committee, stated in response to the Smith Commission proposals, and I quote, the cost of childcare in Scotland are high by international standards and rise much faster than inflation. Childcare is in the clear example where both closer alignment with the Scottish Government's childcare offer and stronger incentives to investment are needed. The bill should empower the Scottish Government to vary childcare allowances via universal credit on the same basis as they are able to uh, vary housing allowances. Uh, unquote. So our new Clause 53 would provide for this power to be devolved to the Scottish Government so that they can do precisely that. I hope that the Government uh, and uh, honourable members across the House would see the value in supporting that particular uh, devolution. Now, I wish to turn briefly to some of the uh, opposition amendments in this section, uh, chiefly to the, the new clauses 39, 40, 44 and 46, and new clause 55 in the name of the uh, SNP's favourite Conservative, the Honourable Member for Gainsborough. Um, we all, as I said at the start of the debate uh, today and also at the start of the debate uh, yesterday, there is not a, a fundamental problem with the devolution of the entirety of the social security system, or indeed the entirety of income tax, the entirety of, of any of these uh, particular their policies, but they do have one thing in common. The uh, honourable gentleman's uh, measures, in terms of his new clause uh, 55, would see an ending to the UK-wide uh, uh, welfare state, and we do not wish to see the end of that particular uh, welfare state. It would come as no surprise for me to uh, say that, so we completely reject anything that would see the end of the welfare state across the UK, um, and devolving uh, to Scottish Parliament the powers of the Smith Agreement stipulated uh, around uh, the Job Centre's national insurance comp- uh, contribution to child benefit uh, would not be uh, desirable in that particular context of keeping the UK welfare state together. I am very grateful to my honourable friend. and In the past, he has spoken quite passionately about the uh, need to pool resources and risks across the whole of the UK. Does he share my concern, therefore, that the uh, effective ending of a UK-wide national insurance system would effectively end the pooling of those risks and, and, uh, and, and responsibilities for a UK-wide welfare state? Mr Crosby, the honourable gentleman must have significantly brilliant eyesight. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the glasses or he's just insightful or he can read minds. uh, Believe it or not, what I'm just about to come on to uh, in terms of my speech. Perhaps we're on the same uh, same, uh, wavelength. So let me just uh, examine some of those uh, issues. I'm I'm a little bit confused, uh, uh, Sir David, because I'm not sure if the Honourable Lady for Banff and Buchan moved new clauses 39 and 40 in terms of the devolution of national... Uh, insurance um, uh, in terms of those. So, so you may be moving them later. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure she spoke to them. I, I, I'm, I'm unaware that she, uh, that she did. But um, let me put on record that we would oppose the devolution of, of national uh, insurance contributions for the very reason that my honourable friend has just said. The pooling of risks and resources made explicit in national insurance, explicit in national insurance contributions. And UK national insurance is the largest insurance scheme of all, uh, securing benefits to all through the widest possible risk pool. Um, the SNP's new clauses seek to devolve national insurance in a manner that betrays a basic lack of the highly integrated and interlocking nature of the social security system. Um, there would have to be a huge array uh, of very complex uh, issues uh, that we would have to deal with in terms of that particular devolution, even if we went beyond the principle of the pooling and sharing of resources. There would have to be a separate Scottish National Insurance Fund to receive all future national insurance contributions of Scottish taxpayers. All existing contributory benefits that have been accumulated uh, up to the vested date would have to be honoured by, by the UK National Insurance Fund. Uh, transfers from the Scottish National Insurance Fund to the, that, the National Insurance Insurance Fund to the UK National Insurance Fund would have to follow Scottish taxpayers moving elsewhere uh, in the UK. And it's some of the issues I think the Honourable Gentleman for Gainsborough uh, had mentioned in his uh, new clause 3 to the uh, first part of this bill when he was talking about full fiscal autonomy that there would have to be a significant uh, redress to the UK National Insurance Fund. We would have to be aware of those uh, particular amendments. There would also have to be issues around survivors' benefits and where those particular uh, people uh, were living. So, whilst there is a principle of not devolving um, national insurance, there is also a key issue with regards to how um, we would have to deal with some of those very complex issues across the United Kingdom. Uh, I would like at this point uh, to look at some of the supporting evidence 
evidence uh, and the testimony of the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations, who have been superb at giving us briefings on some of the amendments, but also the Bill, uh, in terms of what we have been looking at in the Committee of this House. And in their briefing to this Bill, which I am sure members have read, um, they will have made very astute ob- observations as to why devolving national insurance uh, is fundamentally uh, not the best idea for the UK or for Scotland. They said, and I quote, national insurance is used to calculate entitlements to the second state pension and entitlement to some of the old forms of JSA and ESA that are still reserved for universal credit. Indeed, many people will have topped up their national insurance contributions in order to secure their pensions. The Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations does not support the devolution of pensions and, therefore, due to the potential confusion and unintended consequences that may arise, we also do not support the devolution of national insurance." Unquote. That's the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations. There's also an awful, uh, a plethora of other uh, organisations who would warn against the matrix of national insurance being devolved, including the Institute for Fiscal Studies, which in actual fact has been um, positively quoted on a number of occasions from SNP members this afternoon, only 12 hours or so after they completely trashed the organisation for their analysis and full fiscal autonomy. So I'm glad we've had a conversion uh, to supporting the impartial and independent Institute for Fiscal Studies, or perhaps, may, uh, if I may be so bold, uh, Sir David, it could be because the, uh, it suits to quote them on uh, occasions but not uh, on others. So I've laid out the Labour Party's position uh, on devolution. We'll support uh, um, the SNP amendments 118119, if they wish to uh, move those, and we will withdraw ours. So we'll, we were not voting, voting on the same principle uh, in terms of removing the vetoes uh, on these particular debates. I hope that the Minister will be, give us some positive news that we might not have to vote at all. Yeah, Wouldn't that be a wonderful yeah, thing in this particular fantastic. committee? We would, we, would, we would get away early this evening if the Minister just came to the dispatch box and spent 90 seconds saying, everyone's absolutely right and I'm wrong, and I'm going to accept all of these amendments, and Scotland can be flourish with the the welfare state that it uh, deserves and wants to uh, design. I, I will finish by um, going back to where I started, uh, Sir David, in terms of um, the Labour Party being the guardians of the welfare state across the United Kingdom. There is a significant difference between what we believe in and what the SNP uh, believe in in terms of breaking up that uh, welfare state. And these are broad principles, neither is right or wrong, which is we believe in the fact that there should be pooling and sharing uh, across the United Kingdom, and that is a, a principle that we have uh, shared and we have had as a thread through all of our amendments, but what we do wish to see is a bill that responds to the Smith Agreement, that goes further than the Smith Agreement and allows the Scottish Parliament and, indeed, of course, the Scottish people to design something that they wish would be in the best interests of a welfare state that fits not just Scotland but Scotland's communities.